Well, I have the privilege of introducing to you our very special guest preacher this morning. Um, We're taking a break from our series called All Things in the Book of Colossians, and for this reason, when Pastor Bruce reached out to me and said that we had the chance to get Gary Haugen, I said, let's get him. Gary Haugen is the founder of International Justice Mission. I started that in 1997. I first heard him speak at the Willow Creek Global Leadership Summit uh, on a big screen from far away, and all these top-notch leaders were talking about leadership, and this man got up there and talked about God's heart for justice in the world. And I, was, I still remember it. I was so moved by it when I found out that he had, we had a chance to get him at, here at our church. And for you, our church family, to hear from him, I was so excited. And so I'm thrilled to be able to welcome and, uh, and ha- ask you to help me welcome Gary Haugen. Well, thank you, Jeff, for the kind invitation to get to be here at Chapel Street this weekend. It is an extraordinary privilege for someone like me to get to spend these precious moments with you in our culture and in our life. It's just very rare that we have these kinds of moments away from the stress and rush and distraction and just the, the, the harried life that we so easily get caught up into to then present ourselves in church together presenting our best selves to God to say, hey, we are open and ready to to hear whatever it is that you would want to speak into our lives. And especially in the earlier service, there were so many uh, families with small children. And um, it used to be such a heroic thing in our life when we could just get as a family to to church. We had four kids in three years and three months. Uh, We had twins come first and then... uh, to shortly thereafter. And so now when my, our kids are all out of the house, but whenever my wife especially sees these young families coming into church, she just wants to give them a medal, you know, that they actually made it. But in, a, in another way, almost all of us to, to get ourselves here and to just to be fully present um, is, is an extraordinary thing. And I'm really happy to, to, to share in this moment together with you. Uh, if you're like me, you, you don't come to church in order to have somebody just talk at you. If you're like me, you, you come to church in order to be made different. And really, I have nothing to say, no words or, or power to actually bring any life transformation to anybody. But this is the miracle that God seems to do when we present ourselves to him and we allow the word of God to speak to us. So I wonder if we might take a moment just to pray together, to just say, okay, we're here, God. Help us to be present. Speak to us something that might actually give us life. So let's pray for a moment. Kind Father, thank you so much that we get to be alive again today. Thank you that you love us so much. Thank you, Father, that you just receive us exactly who we are in this moment. There's nothing we can do to earn more affection or delight from you. And so we are grateful just to to be here and to be loved by you. And now we, we are ready to receive. Father, I ask that you would speak through me, that you would give something of your word through my words that would be edifying and life giving. And we ask together and for each other especially ones that we might love in a special way in this room that we just might be present for whatever you have to allow some of the noise and self-absorption and distraction to fade away for a few moments so that we might be authentically with you. So speak to us through your word. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus. And we pray these things in the power of his name and for one another. Amen. Amen. Well, obviously, with a faith community of this size, I can't have any idea where each of you might be in your own journey of faith, and you're going to be in all different kinds of places. I feel like I've been trying to follow Jesus for a long time now, but I still find myself challenged by a pretty straightforward question, and this is it. Are Jesus and I really interested in the same things. 
Because I know what I'm interested in, and people around me know what it is that Gary's passionate about, and they could, I could give you that list, and people could tell you the things that I'm really motivated by and focused on in my life. And similarly, you will have that kind of list. So I wonder this morning if we might start by just setting all those lists aside for a moment and begin by asking from first principles in a way that's sometimes new to us to ask but what is God passionate about? What really makes his heart beat fast? And would it be possible for someone to know what God is passionate about by looking at what it is that I am passionate about? This morning I'd like to have us look at two of what are sometimes the more unfamiliar passions of God. And they are very simply, first, God's love for the world and secondly, God's passion for justice. So first, God's passion for the world. I grew up in a church where we always learned John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. It turns out that the whole incarnation, the whole coming of Jesus into the world was motivated by God's love for the world. Now, of course, by the world, we mean all these bazillions of people who are stretched across all these confusing continents and cultures. This is what God loves, all the people of the world. Now, by contrast, what do I love? What am I passionate about? Well, one thing I know for sure is that every single day, I am completely passionate about me. I love me like every day. I don't necessarily love everything about me every day, but it's not like I have to wake up in the morning and remind myself to like, think of yourself today, Gary. I mean, that part comes pretty easily. But my pastor says this is more narrow than I should be. So I'm trying to open up the borders of my heart a little bit. And on a really good day, I will find myself extending love and compassion to everybody in the world who's in my immediate family. This is a great victory, actually, in my family. Uh, when I have a day where I extend more love and compassion to my wife and my four kids than I do to myself. And they usually circle that day on the calendar. And they pray it might happen again next year sometime. <laughs> and then I'll have some, you know... Uh, larger spiritual experience and I will find my heart really starting to grow and I will find myself extending love and compassion and kindness to all the people in the world that I like <laughs> and who like me and who are like me <laughs> and this then becomes my world of passion and focus and energy it's this little shriveled world that becomes about me and mine now, I, I sense that Jesus finds this pretty understandable. This is pretty natural. But I don't know if everything that's understandable and natural is necessarily godly. So at least we, together, maybe can agree upon what the goal is. And even if we're not there yet, wouldn't we agree that the goal is to have a heart that's becoming more like the heart of God and that shares something of his love for the world? Now, I will share with you that this came home to me in a incredibly powerful and personal way many years ago. In 1994, I was working as a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor for the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. And in 1994, you might remember there was this horrific genocide that broke out in this little country called Rwanda. Most of us had never even really heard of this country before. But in 1994, in an eight-week period of time, 800,000 people were murdered. It's really hard to even imagine. I think of it this way because my office right now in Washington, D.C. is about a few thousand yards from the Pentagon, where on September 11th, of course, the terrorists uh, smashed their airplane into the building and people that I knew uh, lost their lives. But the Rwandan genocide would be the same as having that, 
that terrorist attack of 9-11 happened three times a day, every day, for eight solid weeks. Can you imagine? And so when the genocide was over with in 1994, the international community wanted to try to bring the leaders of the genocide to justice, and so I was sent over as the director of the UN's genocide investigation. And I was just handed a list from the UN military intelligence of about 100 different mass graves and massacre sites. So just a few weeks after the war, and so the, the bodies were just still uh, out in the open. And, the, you know, it was horrific to have to sort through all of that carnage for sure. But the hardest part for me actually was having to interview the survivors of these massacres, and especially the children. So one day, I, I had to interview this little eight-year-old girl who had survived one of these massacres. And she had actually lay amongst the dead in one of these churches because the, most of the killing was done in churches because the Tutsi minority would run to these churches for sanctuary and then they would be attacked. And this little eight-year-old girl had lay amongst, amongst the dead for about three and a half days. And then she made her way out into the bush when she was eventually rescued. And I'm, I'm sitting across from this table from this little girl, and I'm trying to get her story out from her. And the first thing you would have noticed about this little girl was the first thing, honestly, that I noticed, which was simply how beautiful she was. For some reason, she still had this twinkle in her eye, and she'd say something funny that would make herself laugh, and then these, these white teeth would just burst across her face. And she was just gorgeous. And I remember looking into the face of this little eight-year-old Rwandan girl, and it occurred to me in the way that I honestly had never thought of before, that the maker of the entire universe specifically intended that this little eight-year-old girl should exist. And while he's making, you know, galaxies and stars and all these other things, at some point he goes, wait, 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 wait. I want to make this little girl. And I want to make her to live and be with me forever. I like her that much. And in fact, I want this, this particular little eight-year-old Rwandan girl to be with me forever so desperately that I'm going to give up my own son to be tortured and murdered to make sure that this little girl is with me forever. And I just completely kind of lost my place in where I was trying to do this interview because I was just blown away in this moment by the cosmic significance of this one little Rwandan girl. But I also knew from the pink machete scars across the back of her head and her neck that she was just about a millimeter of a machete blow from being part of that huge pile of corpses outside the church. And so then it occurred to me deep in my heart that 800,000 other Rwandans who were just as precious to God as that little girl, right, they could just drop off the face of the earth in the summer of 1994. And for me as an American Christian, honestly, it just wouldn't affect my day at all. And so suddenly I could just sense that there was a significant difference between the way Jesus was regarding the world and the way I was regarding the world. And honestly, I just didn't want to be that far away from what really mattered to him. And so it's been a journey now for me to try to open up the borders of my heart from the little shriveled world of me and mine to actually share something of his love and compassion for the world. But you know, it's been interesting because as you do that, as you go into that world and you try to share something of the love of God with that world, the love of this God that we sing about and that we appreciate and love so much, what do you think is probably the hardest thing for people in our world to believe about the Christian faith? I think it's simply the idea that God is good because they're in so much pain. Right, there are more than a billion and a half people in our world today who have zero access to medical care. 
right? They're not arguing about whether or not their medical plan will allow them to choose their doctor or not, or like they will never choose a doctor. They will never see an antibiotic. I was sharing earlier that my son is in the army and he decided to try to tough out an ear infection this summer and the, the guy nearly died just because, no, you gotta have antibiotics or else this thing, if it takes over your body, you're, you're done. But there are a billion and a half people in our, in our world who will never have the opportunity to save their kids with antibiotics. And when they're suffering and hurting and dying, like how are they supposed to somehow find it believable that God is good? Or what about the, the 10,000 kids today who will die just because their parents couldn't get them enough food? And there'll be 10,000 tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And like, holy smokes, like how are they supposed to find it believable that, that there's a good God who loves them? In fact, as Christians, sometimes I think like, well, how does God regard all of this suffering and abuse in the world, all this hurt? Well, thankfully, uh, the, the Bible shares the, the, the heart of God. And we know that ours is a God who, who yearns to bring love and, and compassion. But how does he actually do that? Well, if you think about this question, what is God's plan for making it believable that he is good in the world? Well, the answer from the Bible is really quite a surprising one because it turns out that we are the plan and that he doesn't have another plan. If I was God, I would have come up with a different plan, but this is what Jesus said to us, his followers. He says in Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine among men that they will see your good works and they'll give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I love this verse because it's, it's puzzling. We're used to thinking, well, Jesus is the light of the world. And of course he is. But we, he calls the body of Christ. And so he says to us, you are the light of the world. It's interesting to me because he doesn't say, you might be the light of the world. You could be the light of the world. I hope you turn out to be the light of the world. He says to us, you're it. This is the extraordinary significance of our existence this morning. If we woke up wondering what is even the worth of our being, what God wants to say is, oh, I've put my entire reputation on the line in the world through you. This is what the Apostle Paul says in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, where he says one of the most extraordinary things in Scripture, where he says God is making his appeal to the world through us. And so for 2,000 years, Christians have been trying to make it believable that God is good. How? By going to those who are in need and showing them the love of God. And if people are suffering and hurting because they've never heard the good news that God loves them and sent his son Christ to die for them, we're the ones who actually get to go and share that good news. And if others are suffering because they don't have food, then we can help them with that. And if others are suffering because they don't have medicine or doctors, then we help them with that. And if others are suffering because they don't have shelter, then we can help them with that. And when we do that, they see the body of Christ. That's what we're called. They see the body of Christ actually show up. And it becomes believable to them that God is good. But you know, there's another category of people in our world who are suffering and hurting. And it's interesting because if you think about it, they're not suffering because they don't have access to the gospel or because they don't have food or doctors or shelter. These are the people in our world who are suffering because of the intentional abuse of other people. These are what we call the victims of injustice in our world. Now the word injustice, I don't know if you feel the same way, but I find it's a pretty useless word in our culture now because it means everything and it means nothing. Like what is injustice? As an American, I pretty much feel like I'm a victim of injustice like almost every day, like all day, you know. I, in fact, I went to the grocery store the other day. Oh my gosh, can I tell you this? I'm in the express lane where I'm, I'm always in the express lane 
And you haven't expressed that in your grocery store, right? But there's rules about this. And in my grocery store, right, big sign, 10 items only. So I'm the other day with my shopping cart, I got 10 items. I'm maxing out the opportunity, but I, I got 10 items. Guy in front of me, 13 items. I could count it, right? He's like totally breaking the law, and he's like jamming up the like express lane. And, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm so angry about it. I want to sue the guy because I'm a lawyer, and you know, this is America, and this, you know, we can do this. <laughs> well, just so you know, when the Bible talks about injustice, this is really not what it's talking about. Injustice in the Bible is a particular kind of sin. Injustice is about the abuse of power. The abuse of power to take from somebody else the good things that God intended for them. Their life, their dignity, their liberty, the fruit of their love and their labor. And when someone who is stronger just rips those things away because they're, they're strong enough to do it, God calls this the sin of injustice. In fact, you might remember this is the sin that King David committed when he abused his power as king to steal another man's wife. And then he abused his power as king to steal that man's life. And the prophet Nathan had to confront him for his abuse of power. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 1 says, Behold, I saw the tears of the oppressed. And they had no one to comfort them. But on the side of the oppressor was power. So what does the sin of injustice look like in the world, in our era? This broader, bigger world that God loves so much. Well, in 1997, I left my job at the U.S. Department of Justice and helped found this ministry called International Justice Mission. And we uh, have teams all over the world, uh, and you should just picture local teams in Kenya or Cambodia or Bolivia, Guatemala, uh, and picture teams of Christian, local Christian lawyers and criminal investigators and social workers. And we take on cases of violent abuse and oppression against very, very poor people in, in very impoverished communities. And what do we do? Well, we, we rescue them out of that place of abuse and get them to places of healing and aftercare. And then we work with the authorities to bring the bad guys to justice. And we've been doing this for more than 20 years and have seen more than 50,000 individual people just rescued out of horrific abuse and thousands of these uh, very vicious, uh, violent abusers properly brought to account. And what I can tell you now after 20 years is I have a pretty clear idea of what injustice looks like in our world today. And I'll never forget meeting this little boy in India named Kumar. When I met him, he was 14 years old, but his story began when he was about five years old. His parents passed away. He was, he was orphaned. And so by the age of eight, he had been sold into a brick factory where he worked as a slave, a literal slave with about 70 other people who'd been or were being held by violence inside this compound. And this is how Kumar lives his life. He just works seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day, making and carrying bricks. Never goes to school, never plays. On days when he's been too sick to work, his owner has just kicked him in the head and just dragged him back to the uh, brickworks. Experts tell us that there are in India alone more than 10 million people held illegally in straight-up slavery. Around the world, experts tell us that there are more than 40 million people held in slavery. And so the, the obvious question is, wow, how today is Kumar supposed to believe that God is good? Or how are the other tens of millions of people in slavery in the 21st century supposed to find it believable that there's a good God somewhere? Or what about Alina? I met Alina in the Philippines. She was 11 years old. She lived in a poor town in sort of the outskirts of her province. And her, terribly, she had been sexually assaulted by a man in her town. But what made it even worse was that he was the chief of police in her town. 
We work in communities, uh, very poor communities, where up to 40% of girls are victim of rape or attempted rape by the time they're 14 years of age. And so the question is, again, how is Alina supposed to find it believable that God loves her or all these other millions of victims of that kind of horrific abuse? Or what about Jyoti, a young girl, teenage girl I met in India who was trying to help her family because they were struggling economically. And when some women came to Jyoti and said, hey, Jyoti, you know, we can get you a job in the big city. Why don't you come with us? And then you can send some of that money home to help your family. Jyoti went with these ladies and they took her to the big city of Mumbai. But on the way there, they gave her some tea that was drugged and she fell unconscious. And when she woke up, she was actually in an underground dungeon underneath one of these brothels in the red light district. And after being beaten for three days, she's forced to provide services to the customers and she's got a service between 20 and 30 men a day, seven days a week, never let outside of that brothel. And UNICEF tells us that there's about two million children held in forced prostitution in our world today. So the super challenging question is, how is Joy T and all these other girls somehow supposed to find it believable that God is good? In fact, how, how does God regard all of this suffering and abuse in the world? Well, fortunately, the scripture tells us how God regards it. It's not always the passages of scripture that we're most familiar with, but I remember coming across particularly Psalm 10 when I was in Rwanda. Imagine I am literally standing in a mass grave and I'm trying to think like, God, what are you thinking? How do you, where are you in the midst of all this? And I come across Psalm 10 because it begins with that question and it asks, why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in trouble? And it goes on to explain all the violence that the psalmist is saying is seeing but then he affirms what he knows to be true about God and in verses 17 and 18 he says O Lord you hear the desire of the afflicted you will strengthen their heart you will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more Or just flipping over then to Psalm 3510 where it says, O Lord, who is like you? You deliver the poor from those too strong for them. You rescue the poor and the needy from those who rob them. We could go to many, many, many places in the Bible where God's heart is made clear. And here's the summary of how God feels about all the violence and abuse. He hates it and he wants it to stop. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. But that has always raised another question in my mind, which is, but God, like, what's your plan to actually do something about it, to actually stop it? And the answer from the Bible, once again, is super surprising because it turns out that we're the plan. And that God doesn't have another plan. There's a verse that's on every Christian calendar in the world. It's Micah chapter 6, verse 8, and it says, He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Isaiah 1.17 makes as clear as we could ever want it to be. It says to us, Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. For those of us who've come to trust the Bible as God's word to us, there can be no doubt that God has given to us, his people, the work of justice in his world. But you'll notice when we find out that like we're the plan for get justice done in the world, it's not like we just like spontaneously jump to our feet and we're like plotting like such a good plan, God. It's sort of like, okay, God, just brainstorming here, no ideas are bad, but that's a bad plan, right? It's like, there's some other things that we, like, we're getting pretty good at, but like the whole injustice and abuse and violence stuff, like, where's your team for that? We're the team. And God doesn't have another team. 
But I think it's so easy for me when I hear all these stories and statistics, I just feel completely overwhelmed. I just feel bolted to that chair with despair and my shoulders just go, huh? And I just feel so powerless and paralyzed. And in those moments, I find it so helpful to remember when the disciples in the Gospels are feeling the exact same way. The Gospels are really very entertaining to read if you read them from the perspective of what it was like to actually follow Jesus around and try to do what he asks. It, uh, and there's lots of funny stories, but the one I enjoy perhaps the most is the story of the feeding of the 5,000, which most of us, I think, are familiar with. But do you remember how this story starts? It begins because Jesus has been teaching for a long time, and now everybody's getting hungry. And so the disciples uh, come to Jesus with a really great idea. They, they say, Jesus, why don't you send everybody home to get themselves fed? So if it had been up to the disciples, this would have been the, the miraculous story about how everyone went home and had lunch, which is not a really great story, right? And so Jesus doesn't want to miss out on the fun of this particular situation. So he says, oh, no, no, guys, you guys feed them. Now, the thing I personally love so much about the disciples is how patient they are to explain to Jesus what he clearly doesn't understand about these situations. And so they say to Jesus, Jesus, see, let's be clear there, we would love to do that, but there's 5,000 hungry people. And we did the math over here, and it's going to take a half year's wages to be able to feed them all. And, and honestly, we, we just don't have that kind of cash on us today. So back to you, sweet Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty interesting, right? Because there really wasn't anything unclear about what Jesus asked them to do. He said, feed them. But they looked at the magnitude of the need and they looked at their own little resources and they thought, no, this really can't have anything, else, anything to do with us. There must be another team that's supposed to take care of that. Likewise, with the problem of injustice and abuse in the world, it's super clear from the scripture, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. But we look at the magnitude of the need and we look at our own puny resources and we think, no, this really can't have anything to do with us. So interesting, in this story, what happens? What does Jesus do? Well, he simply asks, well, what do you have? Well, they don't have nothing, so they have to present what they do have, which if you remember from the story, it's the little boy who's got the sack lunch, right, that his mom packed for him to go hear Jesus, and it has five loaves and two fish. And this is presented as the corporate resources that are supposed to meet this massive need. And this is when the apostle Andrew enters the discussion. Perhaps my favorite apostle because he's like the super smart guy. He, he's sort of, I don't know, the intellectual in the group. He's got a graduate degree from University of Chicago, I think. And he looks at the five loaves and two fish and he says, what are these among so many? And see, honestly, this would have been me because I too went to college and I took a math course. And you got 5,000 <laughs> hungry people and five loaves and two fish. And in fact, if you're as sophisticated as I am, and if you understood, understood the deeper sociological roots of this situation, you'd see that there's really nothing for us to do but to sit in the paralysis of despair. But what does Jesus say? He says, give it to me. What do you have, and will you give it to me? And in that moment, Jesus takes responsibility for the miracle and proceeds to feed 5,000 people to overflowing. What I think is worth noticing is that he doesn't ask the disciples, do you have enough? He doesn't ask them to do the miracle. He just asks them, what do you have? And will you give it to me so that I can do the miracle? And can I share with you, this has been my experience now at IJM for more than two decades. At that in 
experiences and moments that feel the most fearful and overwhelming when we have just offered God what we have. He has done the miraculous. You know, Kumar is no longer held in that brick factory as a slave. Our local Indian team was able to infiltrate that place with the authorities. They were able to rescue Kumar and all 70 of those other slaves out. They have been through our Freedom School now. It's a two-year program that allows them to stand on their own two feet as people of dignity and freedom. And now they're able to make a way for themselves in a way that is dignified. And likewise, Kumar, turns out, he was able to go back to school. He's, t- it turns out, a, quite a brilliant young man. He ended up coming back to work as an intern for IJM. And he's been responsible for helping us rescue hundreds of other, of his, other people from slavery in his community. See, Kumar is no longer wondering whether there's a good God who loves him. He knows there's a good God. And now he is sharing that testimony in a very living way with other people in his community. And likewise for Alina, she doesn't have to just live trembling with fear that the bullies in her community can do whatever they want and get away with it. The local IJM Filipino team there was able to take on her case, was able to rescue her out of that place of uh, abuse, but also was able to get that police commander removed from his job. And actually, he ended up serving a life sentence for all of the abuse that he was committing. See, Alina no longer wonders, is there a God who knows her and loves her? Because she has seen the love of God in the love of God's people. And so now she has a testimony that she shares with other young girls who are walking through similar places of darkness. She's gone off to college now and majors in communication. She has a has grown up to have a young family of her own, and she is a brilliant voice now in her own community addressing the problems of violence against uh, women and girls. Because she has a testimony now that there is a God who's true and loving, and she brings that testimony into her community. And likewise, Joti, she's no longer being serially raped inside a brothel. The local IJM team showed up for her, rescued her out, got her to a place of Christian aftercare where she came to know Jesus as her personal savior. See, that that term is not an abstraction for Jyoti. Like, the personal savior of Jesus showed up for her in her life, rescued her out of that darkness, and now has introduced her to eternal life. But she was so moved by that experience that she came back to us and said, you know, I actually know where other children are held in a very dark place. And she led us on a second police raid where we rescued seven more kids out of a brothel. One of those was a girl named Kalindi. And Kalindi said to us, oh, you know, I know where even more girls are being held. And so Kalindi led us on a third police raid and took us to this underground dungeon underneath one of these brothels. And on this day, we brought out 24 of these girls who were being held in a place of unspeakable abuse. But this was the day when the light of God's love went into the darkest place. Why? Because the body of Christ showed up for Jyoti, and then Jyoti showed up for Kalindi, and then Kalindi showed up for these girls who now have an opportunity to know that there's a God in the world who's good, who loves them, who sees them, because that love and goodness showed up in the courageous love of God's people. You know, if you think of that story of the feeding of the 5,000, I was thinking about, like, why did Jesus do it the way that he did? I mean, if everybody was just hungry and Jesus is God, I mean, Seems like a lot more efficient, you know, just like dump manna on everybody or something. Like, poof, manna, you know, eat up and we'll get back to the teaching. Like, like, why did Jesus do it the way that he, he did? I think he did it the way he did for just one reason. I think he wanted to give one little boy a very cool day. Right, because the boy goes home to his mom, right, and says, Mom, guess what Jesus did with my lunch today? He fed 5,000 people. (laughs) 
Now, do we imagine that that boy will ever in his life forget that day? And yet, did Jesus have to have the lunch in order to do the miracle? Or did, he, or did he just love that little boy so much he wanted to just say, wait, wait, wait. Watch what I can do with your lunch today. I also imagine that he probably wasn't the only person who brought some food to hear Jesus speak that day out of 5,000. But he was the one that came forward and just offered what he had with such generosity. And yet that's the boy we talk about thousands of years later. What, jo what, what love and joy for that boy. Likewise for us. What is the miracle that God is yearning to do just when we offer what we have to him so that he can do the miraculous Perhaps it does suggest for us a season in which we rediscover God's passion for the world. That we would ask him to help rescue us from this shriveled world of, of our own preoccupations that sometimes that can just get smaller and smaller and just ask, us, ask him, okay, God, show me a little bit of your heart for the world. And then perhaps it suggests a season of rediscovering God's passion for justice in the scripture. The world will be asking us about all the injustice in the world. It would be marvelous if the people of God had some really, really good responses from the scripture. Not just for the promises of hope, but also the lives of hope that we live. And what a witness that would be in a world that's really, really hurting and, and struggling. At IJM, we've try to provide a ministry that's just very practical for how everyone can be engaged. In fact, I will be asked, well, what can we actually do to be involved? And so we have an opportunity for folks to become freedom partners with us. Uh, perhaps you got one of these when you came in. If you didn't, there's a, a table in the back. And it's an invitation to become a freedom partner with IJM. It's a way of just bringing what you have and offering it to God and say, hey, what miracle can you do with this? Uh, when you become a freedom partner, we will be in touch with you regularly with rescue operations that are taking place that are dangerous and difficult, and we need people to pray. We've been running on 20 years of people praying for us. And so this will be a call to prayer. It will also be a, a, prayer, a, a call to raise your voice. We all, have been, we all have been given a voice of influence. And so especially in regard to... Uh, raising our voices together to address leaders about some of these uh, places of great hurt in the world, we, we can do that together. And when you become a freedom partner, you're organized with us to do that. We just had several hundred uh, come to Washington, D.C. last week to join us with some meetings with uh, representatives on Capitol Hill to talk about some of these issues. And uh, it's transforming when people from back home actually say, hey, we care about these things. It's also a way to sponsor these rescue operations. $24 a month allows us to keep showing up for these things uh, when there are, are needs to, to go in and, and actually bring these people out of great places of darkness. So that's just an invitation to do that. I did get an email this weekend that uh, an IJM friend will double for a year anybody's Freedom Partner commitment with us. So there are just people so full of joy about building the army of of God's people to, to be a witness for justice in the world, that they're just eager to walk alongside with us in doing that. So that's my invitation to you. Because at the end of the day, if you think about it, like why in a world of so much suffering and hurt and need, why has God given us so much? You ever think about this? Because by way of an answer, I will share that when I was growing up, uh, my great ambition for life is I wanted to be a great football player. And um, Jeff and I were talking about this earlier. Jeff turned out to be a great football player. I turned out to be kind of a bad football player. But I had two older brothers who were kind enough to sit me down and explain to me why I was a bad football player. It's kind of a weird thing to do, but they were, they were really helpful because they would say, hey, Gary, see, you're small, but you're slow. <laughs> and of course... Uh, 
what I would do in response is I would go to the weight room, right? And I would try to work out to try to get bigger just so I wouldn't get beat up so badly on the football field. And I would work out and I'd work out and nothing would happen to my body, but I would, I would go and I'd work out anyways. And I'd be working out super hard and then I would always see in their spec- special section of, of our gym were the bodybuilders. I mean, do you have any of these guys in your gym? I mean, just huge, right? I mean, unbelievable, like chest and arms and thighs and neck. And I used to just look at all that muscle mass because it represents like so much strength and so much power. And I used to just ask in my mind, but what's it all for? Because for a bodybuilder, it's just for posing. (laughs) And the only time that all that strength and power is ever really brought to bear is there's the crisis in the kitchen, right? And the jam jar stuck in it. And they pop open the jam jar. See, my prayer for us, in all that God has given us and entrusted to us, that in a world of so much suffering and hurt and need, that God will not leave us opening jam jars. That he'll just rescue us from all things that are just too small, right? That he'll rescue us from all fear that shrivels our lives. And that he will lead us with courage into a world that's yearning to see the goodness of God through us. Let's pray together. Kind Father, we began our time together asking that you would just speak to us some word of truth that was authentically from you. And so we do ask together that you would sift through all the things that have been said of this morning and that you would allow your pure truth to to penetrate our hearts, and that whatever transformative truth that you have for us today, that it might be allowed to take root and bring change so that we don't leave this place this morning exactly the same people who came in, but we, we would ask you to just help us to take that next good step to follow you in your work and witness of mercy and justice in the world. Save us, God, from the paralysis of any despair or discouragement and help us to just offer back to you what we have, nothing more, nothing less. Help us with that and that we might rediscover how you want to use us in our lives to show your love, and to bring glory to Christ in the world. We pray all this together in the name of Jesus. Amen.